Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Ibopedia. I am your host, Chisum, and my special guest on this episode is Abele Okobi. Abele is a public policy director for Africa, Middle East and Turkey at Facebook. Her role sees her engaging with government and other policy influencers. In fact, someone once described Abele as the Secretary of State of Facebook for the region because of her role in shaping Facebook's policy agenda. Abele is a graduate of the University of Southern California, has a JD from Columbia Law School and an MBA from HEC Paris. She currently serves on the advisory board of Junior Achievement Africa. Abele is Nigerian-American and is currently based in London, but spends much of her time traveling between various African countries, from Congo to Nigeria. I'm so excited to have this conversation with her. Today, we're going to talk about her journey from corporate lawyer to technology executive, as well as her activism. Abele, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I do have to say, just because I always try and make this clear, I am a dropout of business school. I do not actually have an MBA. Ah, that's as interesting to know. Yes. <laughs> well, you're fully qualified in every other sense <laughs> with your other achievements. So <laughs> what you've done beyond that supersedes it. So that's absolutely fine. I stand corrected. Thank you, Ma. Well, thank you for joining the show. And I'm sure we'll have such a good conversation. I'm really excited for the topics we'll cover. So let's get straight to it. Let's talk about Facebook. There's been a lot of discussion about Facebook recently on a wide range of topics, from privacy to freedom of speech, to stopping hate speech, stopping the spread of disinformation, etc. In your view, what are the two most important things on Facebook's public policy agenda that would help the company or the organization do better for society? I think it's a great question. I think there are many things, but if I thought I'd talk to, I think one is around values. So around being explicit, both internally and externally, about what values drive our decision making. I know that there a lot of the feedback that we get from stakeholders, I mean, mean, all kinds of stakeholders, from government to civil society, to people who are just trying to use our platform, is that it's unclear to them whether or not the decisions we make are decisions that are expedient decisions or political decisions, or are they really connected to a higher a set of values? So my view, one of the biggest things is to internalize and also externalize a set of values that guide our decision making that are also linked to international human rights norms. That would go a long way. Uh, and then being quite transparent about how we make decisions. I think that will go a long way in helping people, first of all, recognize I think recognize the complexity of some of the decisions we make and also help us tie our decision making, not just when it comes to content, but all of these things to an external standard um, that is outside of sort of political calculations. So that's number one. Number two, it is evident, and this is a problem throughout tech, and it's, it's, it's throughout tech, it is the impact of it is greater, in my view, for Facebook because of the type of platform we have, which is meant to be a global platform. The impact that we have is everywhere in the world. And this is having much more equity and diversity when we think about hiring. So people who are making decisions, a decision looks completely different to have a true global perspective. in the room. And by perspective, I don't mean someone that you've added in as a token to sort of represent the rest of the world. I mean, true diversity, so true power. So if at the at senior levels, power is shared in a way that's much more equitable. I think you would see different, you would First of all, we would be experienced differently. And then second of all, there's a way that you make decisions collectively that is very different when there is true equity when it's the leadership. Two very interesting topics. And just thinking about Facebook within Africa, is it fair to say that most countries in Africa are at an earlier stage of policy and legal development when it comes to social media? And what challenges and opportunities do you think that this offers? Yeah, so I think many countries are. I actually think in some way, there are some countries, obviously there's differences. So some countries are ahead of others. I actually think that this is, it can be an amazing opportunity for the people of countries to lean into the, these conversations around what world do we want. Often the conversations about tech policy or about what don't we want, and it's often quite reactive. Whereas I, countries across the continent, across the Middle East, have an opportunity to think, wait, what can we imagine? What world do we want tech to enable? And what policy environment will enable that? And that, to me, is a challenge of getting people to think, what's possible? And how do we create that? Not, what do I not want to see? So that's one. I also think that people give the continent short shrift when it comes to tech policy, as it's saying, well, you know, there's 
we are so much worse. I mean, anyone who saw Mark being grilled by senators or Congress people in the U.S. could see that there's a lot to learn in all parts of the world when it comes to lawmakers and, and tech. And that's actually, in my view, a little bit of a scary thing because the people who are making the world making the laws don't really understand how technology work, understand how platforms work, then the world that they're enabling may not necessarily be a world that they understand and they may be enabling or stopping things that they don't quite grasp the gravity of. Um, so anyways, the short of the line is that I think that there's plenty of opportunity, but it also means that there is a way that we as Facebook, or I as Facebook doing public policy have to engage with humility. Nobody elected me. You know, I'm not an elected. And so I think what we've been very careful, uh, myself and the team, is when we engage that we are not engaging from a space of this is how it must be. We're engaging from a space of, of no, actually, we are partners in an ecosystem. And it's not for us to create the rules, but it, but it is for us to listen. It's for us to learn. And it's for us to figure out sort of collectively what the world is that we want to see. And I actually think there's more opportunity to do that across the continent than almost any other place in the world, given where we are. And in 2017, you took a trip to Nigeria with the Facebook CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, who you mentioned earlier. What was that trip like for you, in a way, seeing Nigeria through a fresh pair of eyes, or fresher pair of eyes? I can't say it's my top thing at Facebook only because the top thing, thing I'm most proud of at Facebook is being able to assemble a team of amazing Africans, Arabs, Muslims, like our, the team is amazing. And to be able to lead a team like that is my number one, the thing I'm proudest of at work. I would say that Mark Chip is something I'm pretty proud of as well, because when I first got here, I remember being told, oh, he'll never go to Africa, the country. Mm. You know, like, oh, it's so far <laughs> and it's so scary, blah. Um, and that was essentially the message you get. And this is, A, the power of the diaspora. So we connected a group of us who are in different teams, in different in London, in the U.S., and said that this is what we're going to do. And so that trip was something we created and we drove. And on the one hand, the internal ignorance about the continent was something that made you know it a heavier lift. On the other hand, it was great because nobody knew anything, and so we could create it. And so we were very prescriptive about saying this is not a trip to visit orphanages. This is not a trip to be a white savior. This is not a trip to talk about how can we help Africa. That is not what this is about. So we were able to really create a trip that was about opportunity, that was about what is exciting about this particular place in the world. It was also not like a, a random Africa trip. And we're also really clear, I mean, you know the typical places sometimes people go when they want to visit the country of Africa, the places that where they feel safer, or they feel like, oh, there's you know, people like me were like, nah, you're gonna go to Nigeria. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You got to Nigeria, you tried. Like you, yeah. you tried. Like you're serious. And so and, and then creating the narrative of the trip and having it be about innovation and having it be about creators and creatives, it was a huge joy. And also seeing the way I think a lot said about Mark externally from people who don't engage with him who don't engage with him, but there was he was so eager to engage and so eager to learn and so excited about being I mean, even from little things like I mean, he's not the most adventurous eater, but, you know, he ate Emma, he ate over soup. He ate it probably, yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish they called out on the photos. That would have been awesome. <laughs> well, and very open to this, the narrative uh, and for his engagement being about what can I learn, not, you know, how can I help, you know, yeah. the, ben- the benighted continent. So, yeah, it, was, it is one of the things, the times when we had the most amount of fun, uh, that trip and also because it was such a collaboration it was like nigerians across facebook and you know like Uh, if someone tells us we can't do it and it can't happen there's a way we're like oh it's about to happen and so just seeing it uh, when you get nigerians fired up yes man performed unstoppable (laughs) Unstoppable. undefeated yeah those are two fantastic achievements and i think well, credit to you for assembling such a diverse team, because quite often people say it can't be done. And you've clearly just outlined that you have done it. It is an easy thing to do. Most of the people who say it can't be done don't actually want to do it. So, you know, my favorite story is about diversity. So I have a friend of Darren Isom, who is amazing. And he is African-American and works in uh, nonprofits and philanthropy. 
And he told me the story, which I always remember whenever people talk about diversity. And that is that, you know, he was, he's, because of his role, he was often a funder. So he would be coming into conversations as a funder. And he was in a field where he, a lot of the organizations he was funding served black communities. But if you looked at their leadership and their boards, there weren't black people. And so he said that one of the things he would start pushing on is their leadership. What he would hear back, as you can imagine, is, oh, I mean, it's just so hard to find, you know, of course, we would love to be diverse, but it's so hard to find, you know, public level. What do we usually do? So when usually that is said, then we usually start talking about all our accomplishments. Oh, no, I mean, it's not hard. Like, look how accomplished this black person is. Like, that person went to Harvard. He didn't do that. He said he sat in the boardroom. He said, I looked around the room. He said, I told him, I'm, here I am sitting in this boardroom. I know you people. I know your CVs. This is a mediocre bunch. Are you telling me that you can't find a mediocre black person to match your level of mediocrity? That, oh, that, <laughs> that, that to me was so next level. And that's what I think of all the time. This notion that we need to be three times better to get a seat at the table of people who are not, who, are, who don't work as hard or who aren't as qualified. It was an eye-opening thing that this thing of always trying to be better than or respectively about, no, no, no. Equity is being able to be yeah. mediocre. <laughs> as, <laughs> as average white guy. <laughs> as <an average> white <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You often hear, yeah, we're just going to find them. But it's like, where are all these talented, they're just hiding, aren't they? Yeah. All these talented black people. <laughs> they don't want to come out. No, no, no. They don't want jobs. They're running away. <laughs> What's your mission and how are you working to realize that at Facebook? So my personal mission, I think it's such a great question because I think that figuring out what your mission is and what your purpose is, is one of the great gifts and yeah, this tasks of life. And so for me, if I had to crystallize my mission, my mission is about creating opportunity and joy for the Pan-African uh, Black diaspora. It's also about amplifying opportunity for people who have traditionally been shut out or actually deliberately pushed away from power. And so creating, uh, actually dismantling the systems that create inequity. So that's my mission. And uh, Facebook is an incredible place to be able to live out that mission because the role I have is across Africa, the Middle East and Turkey, and these are parts of the world that in many ways epitomize um, how systems of power have been used to keep populations or ethnic groups or people far away from power. And so to be able to also work at a platform where uh, power is manifest in the sense that a platform on the one hand amplifies, amplifies voice so people are communities who didn't have access to traditional forms of media, who didn't have power in that way, in many ways um, can be empowered or at least have voice on social media, not just Facebook, any social media. At the same time, in companies like ours, how we have that we have this enormous responsibility and so to be in a position I can be at the intersection both of the communities that I care about and also the platform and then also be able to look at some of the human rights implications of all of those things I feel like I'm right yeah right in the center of mission for this. And that's excellent that you've navigated your career to marry your personal goals with the goals the organization has. But how did you get here? Because you didn't always work at Facebook. And did you know from a young age that this is what you wanted to do? And how did you get to this point? The face, Facebook wasn't even a thing. Facebook, I mean, obviously, Facebook didn't even exist. So we're all amongst Nigerian friends. And so we know that we have very few career options, right? So, you know, and I say this all the time, but you guys know that you know if you're Nigerian, if you're Igbo, your parents expect you to be a a doctor. You see, that's the best. Um, yeah. Lawyer, second best. Doing well. You know, you couldn't be a brain surgeon, but you know, lawyer is solid. <laughs> Engineer, also good. And there's a whole bucket of things. You know, accountant, pharmacist, all those things. Like there's, but there's a yeah. category. Like that's what and then after that, you just fall off a cliff into yeah. disgrace. Family. So when yeah. I was little. I always thought I was going to be a doctor. So like from when I was two, I had a cousin, uh, Big Abella. So Big Abella was always held out as my ideal because Big Abella started medical school when she was 18, might have been 17. So that was always, from when I was, was a baby, goal. my first memory was how was I going to, how was little Abella, small Abella going to match up to the <laughs> example set by my cousin. Abella. And I remember my mother took me to a because uh, she's a neonatal nurse and she took me to the hospital to sort of follow behind the neonatologist. That was like I was like ten, I think. At the end of the day, I came back and I said, "I'm not going to be a doctor." And so 
you know, which obviously you know, <laughs> already, already a failure. But I said, I will be a lawyer. So since then, I actually never didn't really think it. And part of it is, you know, you're little, so I vaguely thought of being a lawyer. You get to read a lot. I've always been an avid reader. I've always loved to read. You get to read a lot. And also, there's justice involved, and you can kind of yeah. fight for people. It was all very vague. <laughs> when I went to university, you know, you had to well, if you're in the U.S., you do four years of undergrad, and then you go to law school. And I was a psychology right. major because I always loved thinking about or understanding how people thought. So I was a psychology major, sociology minor. I did a ton of classes in theology and religion. But I was sort of on a path to go to law school. But I mm-hmm. went to law school, and it's just I went to Columbia, and it's one of those things you go to a good school and get good grades, and there's sort of a funnel. And it was the late 90s when law firm, I mean, law firms yeah. were exploding. And essentially, they were begging you. They were throwing money at you to come. <laughs> And then I thought, gosh, as a proper Igbo daughter of the Igbo land, how can I not go to the most prestigious law firm? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's sort of my duty. So I just did Christmas rights clinics and I, was a, mm. and I did um, employment uh, law clinics. I did immigration. I did a ton of stuff later. But I went to the a firm. I did, And I also picked the most, in my head, prestigious things, so mergers and acquisitions and corporate securities, uh-huh. which I had no aptitude for. But it was the most prestigious thing. And I ended up, again, at the so doing a ton of pro bono work. And that was the work I loved. And three years in, I'm going to fast forward, I, this was not for me. It was definitely not for me. And so I decided I was going to take a year off and travel and volunteer. And again, that's not a thing. <laughs> yes. You know, are you white? You don't take off and volunteer and yes. travel and not work. But I did that. And that year was a pivotal year. I, I volunteered in Senegal. I volunteered for Children's Defense Fund. But the most pivotal thing is that that was 2001. I left January of 2001. I came back August of 2001. I was planning to see one of my best friends who I had gone to boarding school with him. He had remained a really, yeah, just a really good friend. And I was supposed to see him September 9th. Um, and I said, ah, oh, we'll catch up. I missed it. And I said, we'll catch up later. He worked for Kenner Fitzgerald and he was killed during September 11th. And it was one of those pivotal moments where I I mean it's a cliche but you realize that life is not promised Mm. and I decided then and there that I would only do work that was aligned with mission because when I came back from the year I thought oh I could go back to firm because firms are still hiring randomly even though I've taken this year off to volunteer even though I love this for this work the civil society related work but I could always go back to the firm but that that loss um helped me realize that you don't have sort of the rest of your life to start the rest of your life. And so that was when I decided I only have a job that's mission purpose. Um, and since then, I, I really have. It doesn't mean that every job has been a job that was completely suited to me. I actually spent a lot of time figuring out what I'm, my strengths. I spent a lot of time figuring out what I'm really passionate about, a lot of time figuring mm-hmm. out what's most important to me. I took jobs that didn't work. I took enormous pay cuts, like <laughs> enormous pay cuts. I still laugh at my first salary after I came back from my year of not working was maybe a tenth of my law firm salary. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which, again, <laughs> you know, like, what? Yeah. But again, being really committed. And I think it's also a privilege and it's, it, I feel grateful. It's not something everyone can do to say, okay, I will, I will row really way back on salary to figure out what I want to do in life and what's most important to me. And it was necessary to take that step back. It was necessary to do all that work that I did. Uh, figuring out what mission and purpose was for me in order to be in the position I'm in now. Throughout your the answer to that question, you reference the Igbo culture a lot. Something that runs <laughs> runs in our DNA, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm just interested to know about your early life. Where were you born? What part of Igbo land are you from? What were the greatest influences from the Igbo culture into your life? Yeah, so a couple things. So I was born in San Francisco. I think this is the other thing. No matter where you're born, if your parents are born or Igbo, your house is Igbo land. You can live where... So I remember I grew up in San Francisco and would say, I don't care what your friends do. I don't care what they say at your school in this house. And so that was... I mean, in some ways, I could see where it could be quite stifling. But in many ways, there were a couple things. One, I had was I always had the sense that I could do anything. So I, at no point did I have any sense that I had a limited intellectual capacity. I mean, do they have two heads? Like, yes. <laughs> it's interesting because it didn't feel like pressure, at least to me. It felt like expectation. Like, of course you can. Mm-hmm. And so there is something very empowering. I feel like it gave me all of this ballast 
to approach life and to approach things that would normally be intimidating. Mm-hmm. With I, 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 it is very difficult for me to be intimidated, but that's very much tied to a very erotic mm-hmm. way of child raising, and which I feel I really benefited from. One of the other sort of pieces that I think is interesting is my parents actually never talked about the Baya for more, never. I remember being young and hearing with some Christian song that says, like, it's another day in Nigeria, the children beg for bread. And I remember thinking, when you have people, I, th- I remember being little and saying, no, that they must be talking about Ethiopia. When did children beg for bread? And like, I just, I didn't, mm. although my parents, they left Nigeria right before it started and they couldn't go back specifically because it started. But that wasn't a conversation that they ever had with me. My paternal grandfather was murdered during the Asaba massacre. I never knew oh, that until wow. I was an adult. And interestingly, as an odd ten, tangent, I've always been obsessed with genocide. Even from when I was mm. little, like I always read all of these books, even as a small child, about the uh, Armenian genocide, about the genocide of Jewish people. But no one ever told me. I didn't know till I was an adult, until I was an adult person, and I did my own history. So it's weird the ways in which that part of my family history still had an impact on my life. Mm. And I think it drives a lot of my drive for justice and my sense of fighting against things that are unfair. And then the final thing is that my maternal grandmother was part of the Abba. With the women's people. riot. Yes. yes. Oh, wow. I didn't know. Wow, that's yeah, incredible. So when I think of the way I show up in the world in the sense that, again, always focus on how do I right wrongs, um, not being intimidated, this sense that there is such power in solidarity and that, and that there's such power in particular in black women's solidarity. I feel mm-hmm. like there's a direct line from my grandmother through my mother to me. And it's something, it's a very specifically ego experience. It's something yeah. that I think has shaped me. And in front, you also asked where I'm from. So I always honor, you know, where my father's from. So my father's from Asaba. And my mother, she claims both Abba and Ojotu. Okay. Those are my abilities. I know in Igbo tradition, you're only meant to claim fathers. I think that that's yeah, existence. So I... <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> and you know, as you tell your story, there's so many bits that I can relate to. The Biafran War, especially, because my parents often, they were there during the Biafran War. My father was, uh, I think he was around 10 years old, and my mother was quite much younger. So she was about five years old, four years old. And they referenced the war. So they'd be like, oh, during the war, we didn't get to do this. Or during the war, I met this uncle did this and they tell stories. It was almost like the war was just, it was some anecdote that they never delved into the, yeah. the serious, the pain and the suffering. Yeah. And so a bit like you, until I was a teenager and I started reading, I read half of a yellow sun. Yeah. And I read those stories and I was like, I cannot believe my parents lived through this. Yeah. Yeah. It is uh, shocking. But in terms of the belief your parents had in you, you could totally get that because often it's just like, but you're an A-grade student. Exactly. Why did you get the B? You were born an A-grade exactly. student. Exactly. <laughs> this is what we made you to be. Like, yeah. <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> it has its positives, definitely. Yes. It's a level of stoicism that I don't yes. really understand. Yes. Well, I mean, part of it is Nigeria as a country didn't deal with it. And part of being able to move on was that the victims had to swallow it. And so there was a mm. sense that if you, that it was anti-Nigeria, anti-unity to talk about it or even to heal from it. Yeah. There was never a process of healing. There was never a process of processing it at all. Let's say there's a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> what would your role be? This is my favorite question. And I love that people are asking this question. So I've made it very clear. Zombie apocalypse, I'm a midwife. And here's why. That's what I am. I didn't see that coming. Yes, I have said this. So I love babies. I'm fairly good as it happens at making them. I mean, I'm going to pat myself on the back, you know. <laughs> three, ba- three babies, two in one go, no drugs at all, oh, breastfed wow. them all, even I'm the twins. High five. Thank you. Thank you for the high five. Um, so anyway, I love babies. I love pregnant women. And there is something magical. It's both incredibly mundane because all animals... Like dogs, cats, all of them get pregnant. So there's nothing, in some ways, it's totally mundane, totally banal. On the other hand, it's magic. Like you're a human being and you're creating another human being inside of you. And while you're pregnant, you're in this liminal phase between life and death because we also know that childbirth and the process of being pregnant is also something that comes with great risk for women. So to be able to be, and there's a, a historic role of midwives 
like throughout history in every culture before it got taken over by the patriarchy. But before that, there, there was a role that women played in ushering women through the process of being pregnant and ushering life into the world. So that's what I want to do. I also love giving unsolicited advice. So that's, I could do that as a midwife. I also love midwives through history have been often considered witches, like threats because they held the powers of life and death in their hands. And they were often the most learned women. And I love that too. So the notion of being a threat to sort of establish norms is also something I love. So babies, taking care of pregnant women, giving advice, and also uh, being that buffer. There's something about it, particularly when you have a new baby, like everything is new and you're completely overwhelmed. And so to be able to be sort of a handmaiden to women during that process just seems like one of the highest, yeah, like the highest and best use of time. And I may do that. When I'm old and I retire, I may still do that. I I can see that somehow. (laughs) I can see it happening. (laughs) You talked earlier about giving a voice to the voiceless. And I just want to touch a little bit on your activism and different causes that you stand for. So you're currently on the advisory board of Junior Achievement Africa. So talk and... And the trustee for the Young Vic. And the Young Vic is, is incredibly, uh, the Young Vic has a history of theater for, or telling, uh, amplifying voices and theater for, in particular, people who, who are for different types of audiences. And right now, the creative director of the Young Vic is, is uh, Kwame Clarema, who is a black man. And if you look at theaters of this caliber worldwide, there are very few, like you can count on one hand the number of creative directors, black creative directors of theaters of this caliber. And so I'm super excited to be on the board of this. And also because stories are so important, we're talking about books and I think stories and not, not magical Negro stories or stories where of black people who are excellent. So it's not, not that it's black people's full humanity. So black people is human beings. So we're not necessarily all good, not necessarily all bad. And so that's why I think, the work that's being done at the Young is really important. I'm also on the board of CARE International um, UK of, of London. So a little bit of international development as well. I would say the Young Vic, I saw the tree there. Yes! Um, which was a fantastic performance. And they said it was an immersive performance. And I think that was an understatement. That yes! Was incredible. Performance. I'm so glad to hear that. Did you see the convert? No, I didn't. I oh didn't my know. goodness, it was amazing. Or a Fairview. Yes, Fairview I saw. What do you think about Fairview? Sorry, digression. I actually really enjoyed Fairview, but it was so... I thought the ending... I don't want to create any spoilers, just in case yeah, don't. people... Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was just... I don't think I've ever seen... Been to anything like it. No. There's nothing like it. Like No. I tried to read the blurb beforehand without no, no, no. reading spoilers. And it didn't prepare me for what I... No, no, no. <laughs> it can't prepare you, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't prepare you. Yeah. But I thought that was excellent. But I feel like that kind of change could only have been done with Kwame at the... Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I think the work he does is so incredibly important. Like being the courage to tell those types of stories and to tell a multiplicity of stories from across... I mean, obviously he tells there's all kinds of plays. It's not just only about the Black diaspora, but he has been quite intentional and deliberate about amplifying voices from across the Black diaspora in a way that I think is really beautiful. Let's switch gears a bit and talk about racial inequality. So the US and much of the world is just reawakening to racial inequality and injustices. However, your personal story and personal journey of reckoning with racial inequality started long before May 25th, 2020. Firstly, as a black woman, most likely your first memorable experience of race, like most black people, probably took place during childhood or at a young age. And secondly, is the fact that your brother, Chinedu Okobi, died a couple of years ago, age 36, after being repeatedly tasered by US police officers. He was unarmed. Your brother Chine Du's murder is a reminder to all of us, particularly to people who aren't black or an African-American community, not just in the US, but across the globe, that discrimination is something that every black person faces. What to some people might seem like just another stat on the news or on the TV is actually a person, is someone's son, a little brother, a father. What does justice look like for you and your family? Ah, so that's a big question. So what justice looks like for me and my family is, is equity for all, if that makes any sense. So there's no such thing as justice Well, first of all, no one can bring my brother back, right? So in a perfect world, my brother would not have been murdered. But it's not possible for justice to exist 
for our family until there's justice for every black person. That's what justice looks like. What justice looks like is a world where black people don't have to walk in fear just because they're black people. Let's pull it out because what happens is I think, particularly in the UK, first of all, people uh, deny the extent to which the UK has its own issues. Uh, when it comes to disproportionate stop and search, when it comes to disproportionate deaths in custody in the UK. So yes, it's not as bad as the US, but what a low bar. Mm. What a low bar. And I always say, who else would be expected to live like that? To be told, well, I mean, it's not as bad as you guys being killed, murdered in the streets in the thousands. It's not as bad. Like who would allow themselves in a democratic, putatively free country to live with that bar? And who's expected to allow that other than black people? So that to me is what justice looks like. Justice looks like is looks like a world where that doesn't happen. And that's not just in majority white countries. We have to value black lives in our own countries. I mean, as Nigeria, that's an issue as well. We have to value black lives. And obviously there is a straight line between the devaluation of black lives in the streets of San Francisco to the devaluation of lives on the streets of uh, Lekki. It's from the same root. It's from the same historic root of thinking of black people as less than, of black people as less than human. All of it is comes from the same thing. So yeah, what does justice look like? Justice looks like a world where black lives are actually valued, where black lives are able to exist and be fully human. Mm. On an individual level, given the historical context and the time frame where this injustice has been happening, what would you say each one of us can do well, so I think there's different answers, right, depending on where you're situated. So what you could do is, is different from maybe a white person who's listening. I have to admit to that I think in particular post, like a couple of years after my brothers, I've gotten exhausted. And this year, I think, was really hard as well. So there's something I can't describe. It's such a strange feeling to watch the world discover racism. And there's this weird thing where you're saying, you're like, why was it this one? And I'm not saying in any way that it shouldn't have been, but do you know how many of us have been murdered on streets? Why this one? Like, why did we decide that we cared about this human being and not about any other human being before? And of course, the reasons, you know, people, there's, you know, COVID and people were attached to screens in a way they weren't, maybe, but I'm just saying, as a person who grieves my own brother, there's this sense of oh, so now you've discovered this, so now you care. Why did you decide to care now? So that's fun. But I think as a result of that, I think as a, especially as a result of this year when many of us were pressed into service to explain racism. So to be in a position where you're hurting, where you're, exper- you're experiencing trauma, but you're, the expectations that you then retail your trauma for the education and edification of other people who have been spectators, I have an allergy to this education role. Having said that, the one thing I will say is is there has been a tendency for people who were spectators to then hear the story specifically about police brutality and then to say, okay, well, that's a bad thing. We recognize police brutality, but not to interrogate the ways in which which white supremacy held them, hold them up or the ways in which they were perpetuating white supremacy in their own lives. So at work, for example, why are we all, why are you okay with a leadership team that's comprised of all white people? Why is that okay for you? Why are you okay with the team that services Africa and is all white people? Like, why are you okay with that? The only thing that makes it okay is, is the white supremacy inherent in it. On some level, you think that white people are superior to black people, and that's why they're not there. That's why we're not in those positions. Otherwise, why would it be okay to have a team that had absolutely no diversity at all? Why is that okay with you? So I do think that people need to dig deeper into these moments and figure out and not think of white supremacy or inequity as a thing that's happening far away on a street in America or by a police officer, but think about the ways in which they actually benefit from white supremacy and the ways in which they they want an equitable world need to divest or step aside from the from the privileges that they've been afforded as a result of the pain and disenfranchisement of other people. Desert Island recommendations. So yeah. the scenario is yeah. You are stuck on a desert island and you have a couple of choices and you can take a few limited things. Let's talk about podcasts. What podcasts would you download on your playlist? Uh, This is where I think we're going to part ways a little bit and you're going to hate me a tiny bit. I hate podcasts. I know. I know. I'm going to have to edit that out. I know. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just do. But I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I don't know. I just don't like listening to things. 
my mother would tell you that I learned to read when I was two, which is very evil. From yeah. the Bible, also evil. <laughs> very evil. She will tell you that as soon as I learned how to read, I refused to be read to. So even like I was a little, little person and she will say that I would say, I read myself. So <laughs> since then, I can't do books, like books on tape or whatever. Yeah. I can't do that. I can't do podcasts. If someone's doing a podcast, I'm always like, what is the transcript so that I can read it? <laughs> because I can read way faster than you guys are talking. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which I know makes me a terrible person. And I'm also on a podcast. So my short answer is that I wouldn't have one because I don't really listen to it. Okay. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Moving on to your favorite book or books, what would you take with you? So here's the thing. I mean, you can see now this is one tenth, actually like one twentieth of my book collection. If I were in a desert island, I would need to take essentially the ability to have books shipped to me or at least a Kindle. I hate Kindle. I hugely love books. I can't say it's a favorite book. I can say like lists of books that have been particularly that have changed sort of the way I think about um, some things. Mm. And I'm just thinking of just some of the most recent ones or ones that, that stick out because I have to admit, I did prepare well. So I just read a book, Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper. It is an African-American woman professor and she talks about misogynoir. It's a book about feminism, but from a very specifically black American context. And it's pretty because I've been I, I was struggling with how I channel rage and whether and, and rage is sort of a, as fuel as opposed to rage as something that's corrosive. Mm-hmm. And I thought that uh, there was a lot in there that I, I found really powerful. They were her property. Another black woman that talks about the slave trade and or slaveholding in the U.S. but talks about uh, white women as slaveholders because often the narrative about slavery mm-hmm. is that. This was something that men did and it was sort of imposed upon women and women weren't active participants. And so this talks about women as active participants. There's another book called um, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. It is a study of violent resistance or the the use of armed resistance during the civil rights movement. Because often the top line is, you know, that people went and marched and, you know, they were beaten and that was all that happened. And this talks very specifically about actually the utility of armed resistance uh, during the civil rights movement. Oh, I think for a lot of, so it's interesting because I think people have different points of view, but Shimamanda, when I read um, Half of the Yellow Sun, that for me was like, you know, the Roberta Black Sun, but strumming my pain with his fingers. Like, yeah. I was reading something that in my view so mirrored my life experience. So many of her books did. Like, mm-hmm. even the... Uh, Americana. Called? Americana, the one before that, the Orchid. The, oh, the Purple Hibiscus. The Purple Hibiscus. So much of what, and it was such an amazing thing to read this mm. beautiful writing and to feel seen in that yeah. writing and yeah. to have her articulate things that felt like family things that no one else would know about. And she was mm. writing them in such a beautiful way. Um, so her writing has always felt like home to me in a very specific way. I love the way she is in the world. Like the way she shows up in the world is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. It's like, it is pure robotic amazingness. Mm. Whenever I see her doing her thing, I'm, I'm inspired and encouraged. But that's just a few. I, mean, I can send you a list of others, but those are the ones, some of the ones that can spring to mind. I'm taking notes. I love the various authors you've described. In terms of music, would your top, let's say top three tracks be? Okay, I can't say track, but I love Rhymo. Are you familiar with his music? No, I've heard of him, but I don't listen to him. I really quite like his music. So obviously I love David Duo and I love like a lot Nigel. Yeah. But there's something really different and weird and very musical about Rami. So I love all the stuff. I love Adekunle Gold. Like I love all of his yeah. you know, his CDs. I'm trying to think who I'm who am I playing now? Let's look at my library and see. What's that. on your heavy rotation? What's on my heavy rotation? Yeah, yeah. So Adekunle, I'm doing that a lot. You know how you have a song that you know you have no business listening to, but the beat is tight, and also there's something about it. So I have to admit, WAP I find first well, of all I think yeah. I mean the beat is hot. Leaving aside the transactional view of sexuality that's quite problematic and actually upholds the patriarchy, if you left that as- aside, I think there is something amazing and funny and joyful about Black women talking, singing, rhyming about sexuality. And quite frankly, there's a lesson in there for many people who may have been confused about the function of a very (laughs) (laughs) very useful 
part of the body. So in many ways, I felt like they were doing God's work. And again, leaving aside the transactional, I don't like the transactional part of it, but this thing of being yeah. joyful about sexuality, I thought it was an amazing thing and the beat site. So Yeah, I have to agree with you on that one. I love hip hop music. Yeah. But I struggle to reconcile being a feminist right. and liking hip hop music. It's really hard. You're, I'm always negotiating and I'm always navigating it. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting how many times black women are forced to dance to their degradation, right? Like yeah. <laughs> hip hop is basically my whole, you know, it started when I was a little kid. And so it's my whole yeah. life. Yeah. And you'd be on the dance floor dancing and say, oh, damn it. Like, I can't. So you're obviously a successful black woman, you have climbed the career ladder, and you have children as well. What are the greatest challenges you think are for working mothers? What challenges do you think they face and how these can be surmounted based on your personal experience as well? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I think that evil women have a particular advantage in this, in the sense that historically, I mean, generations and generations of evil women have always worked. So there isn't a sense that you, there is a sense that there is something that evil women are supposed to bring about, even in the most traditional, and by traditional, because remember, sometimes the way we describe traditional is only post-colonial traditional, because there's a way that evil culture operated pre-colonial that in many ways is actually quite supportive of, like, there's a reason why there's so many powerful women in evil, there are so many powerful evil women, because there's a way in which our traditional culture actually nurtured and expected women to be powerful in a way that I think colonial cultures did not. So I think a huge advantage to that for, for me was always the sense that it was not undermining to my identity as a mother to be a woman who worked and not just a woman who worked, but a woman who loved working. I have never at any point felt guilty 